let's go over last night. What was the react? Like, bring us inside the hall. What was the reaction uh, of the delegates to the various speeches last night? You know, it was interesting. One of the ones I was anticipating the most was obviously Nikki Haley's speech. Um, she wasn't supposed to be here in the first place. This was supposed to be a message of unity. And there was mixed response. Some people were cheering loudly, loudly and other people were booing. Actually, something not that you've he been hearing that much here is booing. When Chuck Schumer came out, or rather Mitch McConnell, oh, that'd be something, Chuck Schumer. When Mitch McConnell <laughs> came out um, just yesterday, or Monday rather, there was a ton of booing, the whole floor booing. But we haven't heard it since then until Nikki Haley's speech. And so I thought that was something that was really interesting, mixed messaging on her. And then obviously, so Donald Trump and J.D. Vance were not supposed to come out until after her speech, but they essentially changed the schedule. I don't know if it was specifically to hear her and Ron DeSantis, but I love that because we were able to see what his response was, something that people were eager to see. And it was interesting. Uh, you know, he didn't show much emo emotion, just a little bit of smirk when she gave that full-throated um, support to him. Uh, but the mixed messaging on the floor, I think, told me a lot about how their the delegates are still feeling about Nikki Haley. But, but did it change? I mean, she, I thought, look, after Ted Cruz in 2016, where at the end he said, vote your conscience, and people went nuts, um, and Trump had come into the room, like, I felt like, to your point, he knew they must, they must have th had the speech, because once she came out and gave that full throttle endorsement right out of the gate, did that change the tone, or was there still some skepticism? Because I know she went on saying, you know, we don't always agree. Was So was there still moaning after that or was it just initially? I think it was initially. It wasn't after that, after she came out. And I think she knew she needed to do it for do it for just that right. reason, uh, because there was concern about her being here. After that, it toned down and people were raw, raw. Uh, but, you know, it was interesting to see that I feel like Donald Trump and you tell me what you're seeing on the other side of the screen from him in person. He is much more. Um, somber, I think, than we normally see him. And we even saw him last night sitting when some of his family, his family was standing around him at different times. And so that's been interesting. And also, you know, as you know, but some viewers may know, it's really unprecedented to see the candidate until Thursday night. And so the fact that these delegates that the country and the wor world are getting to see his reaction um, to some of these surrogates is fascinating to watch his um, response to them. And I, I don't know if that's for good or bad because people really are just honing in on what does he think about what they're saying about him? And that one part where she said, you don't have to agree a hundred percent. You could kind of look at his face and he was like, what? Um, so yeah, but, but, but she followed that up, right? She followed that up. She followed that up by saying, and still vote for him. And I yes. think that's what we need is people to say, Hey, I'm with you 70, 80%. And I'm still with you. I actually thought that message, I get it. If you're a delegate, you're probably 100%. But what she was saying to the rest of America is, if you still have some reservations, if you're a double hater, it's okay. You can vote for Donald Trump because 70% of the policies, 80% of the policies, you probably agree with. Well, that's a good point, Sean. And I do think it's something else as you see um, the campaign really trying to make that narrative for J.D. Vance, because obviously he was not a huge Trump supporter in 2016. And some of the things have come out again, resurfacing about what he said against the former president. And they're using that same message that you just said, ultimately lean in. You don't have to be 100 percent for him, but understand that his policies work. And that at the end of the day, I think what Laura Trump said last night, um, that people saw a different side of Donald Trump on Saturday night. And it's also something, obviously, you know, the former president very well, Sean, but you and I have spent time with him as well. And it's something that I've always wondered why he didn't show that kinder side to himself more often to the public, something that people get to experience behind closed doors, but that the world doesn't always get to see. And I think in light of Saturday's events, you're starting to see that side of him a little bit more, which is interesting for the world to see. And I do think as you know, we know that he's had issues with suburban women, that could be the deciding factor for them. Um, ultimately that they see now a different side that many people have never seen before. So after Nikki Haley, I mean, look, I, I, I think last night, I was talking about this with Mark Halpern this morning. We have this morning meeting that we're doing at 8.30 in the morning. And I said, what I thought was fascinating was, was the mix. You had everyday Americans telling their story, someone about the, the 
personal repercussions of an open border, the, the repercussions of fentanyl in our country. Then you had Nikki Haley, as you've discussed. You had Vivek Ramaswamy. You had Ron DeSantis, Sarah, Suck Sarah Huckabee Sanders, Laura Trump. What Walk me through kind of the different reactions that people had. Are the everyday American stories penetrating? Is the hall full? I saw some chatter among the media that there wasn't that many delegates. And I, at the end of the day, I don't really care. I mean, this is being broadcast to millions. Um, how, how are the various different speakers going over? You know, it's been interesting to see how the campaign has tried to kind of weave them in and out to your point. Um, that they don't want people only showing up for the big name speakers and delegates only arriving for those big key moments. And so you see, you know, some of these everyday Americans speaking after a Nikki Haley or after a Ron DeSantis to try to weave them in, because I think that something that they've done really well is get these people that have really powerful stories to share with American people. And that is one of the things I think that J.D. Vance brings to the table as well. That he's I want to talk about him in a steps. second, but OK, that he's walked in the footsteps of many everyday Americans. And that's the stories that you're hearing shared. So I would say the people that are in the room, those stories are landing very well uh, because those people are so eloquent, eloquent and sharing um, their stories with passion. But to your point, those ones that are earlier in the night, the hall isn't as full as it should be. And that's why I think it's important that they continue to intersperse them out throughout the night and not just pack um, the last half of the evening with some of those huge name speakers. Yeah, I saw that one woman who lost her son to fentanyl, not because, I mean, because literally he took the wrong, he didn't overdose, he literally took the wrong pill. And the crowd started chanting, Weston, Weston, Weston. It was very powerful. I can't imagine what it was like in the hall. But um, let me ask you this. Logistically, you're mentioning the schedule, right? And, and how it's being kind of laid out maybe to get more people engaged or whatever. When, when is it that like someone like you, who's covering it, who's there, is given the schedule. Are you getting it hours in advance? Because I know even tonight we know the theme, but we don't know the, the, the speakers. Yeah, this is fascinating. We're getting it at 10 a.m. So the RNC is doing a press conference every morning at 10 a.m. And that is when they let you essentially know what the rundown is going to be for that evening. And it's all for planning purposes only. So they don't even want Meaning to what? Meaning on the record. What is for so, so for, for your you're not allowed to say on the record exactly what's happening that night. So I think, I mean, obviously, as someone that's in communications, as you've been for a long time, I think that's a really interesting play. I don't quite understand why the campaign is doing it. The campaign is the one who is up there yesterday with Jason Miller, who was at the podium, literally going line by line down what the schedule is going to be for that evening. But I will say they told us that Donald Trump was going to come out at 902 and he ended up coming out around eight o'clock. And I think that was to hear Nikki Haley's speech. And so they're kind of adjusting things a little bit differently than they've said. I don't know if that's because they're changing things on the fly and they don't have it buttoned up yet. And they're kind of adjusting as needed or if they're just trying to have moments of anticipation. And I'll also say something that's interesting, Sean, on Monday night, they went through the entire rundown. Danielle Alvarez went through it from the campaign, but she didn't talk that um, Glenn Youngkin was going to be speaking. Um, and there were a few other people that she didn't mention as well. Uh, Ted Cruz didn't mention that he was going to be on the lineup. And so I don't know if they're trying to have these elements of surprise to keep people on their toes um, or if it's because they're changing things so much. It's unclear. Yeah, I, I think the third bucket is because Trump's got his hand in there and he's saying, I want to add this person. I want to change this up. I actually think that's a very strong possibility based on my history with him that they don't want to get out in front of him because they know that he might say, I want to add Ted Cruz or I want to move Ted Cruz or I want to move up Nikki Haley or I want to show up in the hall early. Yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, I think we both saw this we work convention 2016 year at the RNC. I was at the Committee on Arrangements. And when the Trump campaign kind of got embedded with the convention, he changed everything. I mean, he was so involved in everything. We were adjusting plans so much. And to your point, it was down to the last minute. And we were we put out stuff, forecasted it more <laughs> in advance than they're doing right now. And that's my point, too, about some of these everyday American speakers are they going to pack the evening right before jd vance who comes out one of the big questions is when is melania going to come is she going to come uh it was asked yesterday in that press conference if more family was arriving and they said maybe um obviously she's gonna know, look okay, you tell me you Lindsay, she's gonna come? I, 
I, I, I, she will, when he gets on stage, when Trump gets on stage and delivers his acceptance, she is going to walk out from backstage and join him on stage. She may not speak. She will be there and she will come out with him. I wouldn't be surprised if Ivanka does as well. I think you're going to see the whole family that night. That's my guess. I think you're right. I mean, at the end of the day, they're such a close knit family. And I know that Ivanka and Jared have been trying to stay out of the political realm a little bit more of uh, recent days. And Melania has not been as outspoken. But I think in light of Saturday's events, how do you not show up as a family? How do you not support your dad? I just think that that would be odd for this family. You know them even better than I do. Uh, But for a big moment like this for their dad and her husband, I think you have to show a unified front. Not only that, but I mean, Trump gets the showmanship, the idea of bringing Melania out from behind and Ivanka. I mean, look, I I think people tune in to your point about Trump showing up last night. He brings people in uh, in terms of interest and excitement. What's his reaction? How's he going over? I was glued to the split screen last night watching how he reacted to Nikki Haley and DeSantis, even Sarah and Laura. It was like you could tell it was touching him. The stories that Sarah and Laura in particular, because they were personal, they touched you know, him. And I, I mean, oh, I don't mean yeah. to sound like a psychologist. <laughs> you know, but it's so interesting because I was about 25, 30 feet from him when he walked out on Monday night. And I thought he was about to cry. And I've never seen the, the former president cry in my life. And I was like, that would be a moment. But to your point, even last night, he seemed very moved by what people were saying. And that's what I mean by seeing a more somber uh president. It's not just raw, raw. He's really taking in the moments. And I think it goes back, you know, to even things that he said, how I shouldn't even be here. I I should be dead. And so I think the fact that he's able to take all this in and then to your point, he is the ultimate showman, right? He understands media. He understands like what makes a great moment. And I think that's why on top of other reasons that he's here every night, because it's drawing attention. People want to see him. They want to see his reaction. And so the fact that he's giving that to the convention in some way, it's a gift to the delegates, but it's also interesting for the viewer as well. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe and click the notification bell to get more.